I get a bit tired sometimes when people with brown skin are only asked questions about race or ethnicity. And it's, you get the usual stereotypes. So can I ask you a question about being a, a, a writer and somebody who teaches creative writing? You said in an article, either last year or the year before, that a lot of people who attend creative writing classes actually belong in a mental asylum, or words to that effect. <laughs> Could you elaborate on that, please? <laughs> I didn't quite put it like that. <laughs> I got into a lot of trouble for saying that. The dean went mad. <laughs> Apparently the dean was woken up in his pyjamas. And, <laughs> and, 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 and the dean had never heard of me before. Um, but I do teach creative writing. And I teach at Kingston. Um, and I, I think it's important to teach. And I was taught. I was not taught in a school, but I was taught by my father and by various editors. Uh, and by movie directors, and I still learn from other people, and I think that's a big deal, I think it's important. So it is important that you work with younger writers and help them to, to speak. I think it's sometimes crazy to do it in universities, um, because it's a very formal system and they end up getting MAs and PhDs and so on, and you think it's completely, did Kafka have a PhD in creative writing? <laughs> do you know what I mean? It's not really that kind of thing. But you can help people to write, and my students get, get better as writers. They weep a bit, but they get better on the whole. Um, and it's important to work with, one, with, with young people who want to speak, who've got something to say, to help them find their words. So I would denigrate the institutions because I'm a rebellious sort of fellow. But I think it's important to work with young people and help them to speak, to write. And I think that's a big deal for them. Um, and I think if you know something, as I do a bit about writing, you have a duty to, just as my kids go to violin lessons and guitar lessons and all that stuff, you have a duty to work with other people to encourage them to write. Um, and insanity is no disadvantage in an artist. <laughs> I mean, it may be a disadvantage, let's say, in an airline pilot. <laughs> and you, you wouldn't want a mad airline pilot. But a mad writer, you know, what you want is maximum madness and maximum control. And then you've got an artist. Uh, I don't go to the pictures very often. I saw Venus, and it was brilliant. And ah. what drove you to write that? Venus is about an old man and a young girl, a really old bloke played by Peter O'Toole, <coughs> and a really young girl played by Jodie Whittaker. I can't remember why I wrote it, actually. It seemed a really good idea at the time. It was something to do with ageing. I was very interested, and still am, in a sense, interested in ageing and decay and, you know, and all that stuff. Um, and interested in sexuality and what happens to it as you get older and so on. And I wanted to write a film about an old man who was thinking about his life, about his girlfriend, about his love. And then Roger Michel, who directed the film, said to me, why, instead of, instead of, as it were, this old bloke reminiscing about what happened to him 25 <coughs> years ago and the women he's loved, why not actually have him falling in love with a girl in the, in, in the story now? And that seemed to me to be a really good idea. And then you've got something going between these two people and you think, what can they do for each other? What possibly could they have in common? And you've got a story going. Um, I think that's how it happened. Um, Hanif, um, in your work, um, pop music and punk and pop culture in general, it seems to figure quite prominently um, in various books that you've written. Um, and you've talked about kind of the effect here in the Rolling Stones had on you when you were a teenager. I was wondering, do you still have any kind of affinity for pop music and how do you kind of um, view it today and how do you sort of see how it is kind of consumed and um, the role it plays in pop culture today? Um, it was very shocking to be in the suburbs and see Jimi Hendrix on top of the Pops and the Rolling Stones and it represented such a blast of sexuality, of freedom, of weirdness, of some other way to live that it really shocked me and my mates and all of us. Um, and it seemed like another world, another place, and uh, 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 offered a prospect of, you thought, I want to be Jimi Hendrix, 
I want to be with Jimi Hendrix tonight wherever he's going, you know. Um, I don't know if, I mean, my kids are in a, in, a, in a band and they listen to Jimi Hendrix too now. I don't know if it represents to them that, any freedom, because they have, you know, the whole world is organised around teenage boys and girls. It serves only them, the whole world. <laughs> Um, but pop then represented something that was so shocking and startling. And as a writer, I thought, I want to be like that. I want to have that effect on people. I want to really shock people and amaze people and excite people like that. So that's what pop meant. And it linked to what was going on in Vietnam and what was going on in Prague and the other struggles of people around the world. That pop represented a sense of excitement and, and freedom and possibility then, I guess. I can't answer the question about what it means to people now. You'd have to. It would be better off. You'd be better off asking, asking them. Um, and it would represent different things in different places. In the suburbs of, of Paris, if you were an African immigrant, music would mean a different thing to you than it would mean if you were a, you know, a white public school boy listening to rap now, in West London, for instance. Um, but it was that. It was the shock of something that suddenly represented a new world to us. That was, it. And I wanted to write about it. I wanted to put it into a book. But it had never been in a book before. I mean, I read E.M. Forster and I read Huxley and I read Evelyn Waugh and all the best Graham Greene, but they didn't have... There was no Jimi Hendrix in any of them. <laughs> um, so I had to find a way of putting these things together. My question is related to identity as well. As an award-winning writer, would you have been like to be invited to the royal wedding? <laughs> That's a great question. <laughs> That's an all-time great question. I had a great question the other day, which was, when you cast actresses in your films, do you, ha do you have to see them in the nude first? <laughs> <laughs> which was my all-time favourite. Um... I didn't watch the Royal Wedding, and I was really annoyed by the whole thing. Um, and I'm, I'm, I'm sure I, they were not disappointed that I was not there. Did you take your CBE back? I, I didn't send my CB, CBE back, no. Um, They'll take it back. It seemed to me that, that it was a bollocks, really. <laughs> that as, as Kenan said earlier, that we've gone to huge tr trouble to turn this country around in some sort of w other way to make it diverse and mixed and so on. And they had a wedding that somehow w uh, represented Britain or branded Britain in some way that seemed to me to be, to be nothing to do with anybody's life whatsoever. That was not my life or my friend's life or anybody I know's life represented there. And it seemed to show us as, uh, as you know, nostalgic and... <coughs> and fatuous, really. I mean, how can anybody like a family that's got Prince Andrew in it? <laughs> I mean, in a way, we've all got Prince Andrew in our own family, but... <laughs> <laughs> you wouldn't put him on maybe, a balcony having wave, uh, having waved... And maybe he should be on a creative writing course. <laughs> I think it would do him some good. Um, so I, I was rather relieved, as I say, not to, not to, be, not to be invited. There goes my knighthood. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks, Honey. We, we, we had to unfortunately draw it to a close. Um, well, thank you very much. It's been much um, hugely you. entertaining, hugely thank informative. You. Thank you. Now, after that uh, last remark, ladies and gentlemen, I have to promise Hanif something that is certainly better than a PhD, arguably um, better than that elusive knighthood. That is the Asia House Award for Literature. And uh, it seems superfluous almost to say that uh, I speak here for the older generation. And since I read Baldwin and Ellison, uh, I've never found myself on the platform, you too, sir, with so many dyed-in-the-wool, heart-feeling liberals. I, <laughs> I have loved the talk this evening. It's one of the finest I have heard in any setting. Um, and it, it chimes so well with what we try to do at Asia House is deal with serious problems and in a way that liberates. And I love the way you, you explained um, the liberation for all of us that you've been so much party to. Uh, the
prize uh, reflects a... One sec. <laughs> <laughs> reflects, uh, well, as I was about to say, the, the, the genius of April Gao, but beyond that, it, it, it reflects this passion we have in our own way at Azure House for building links and doing good, and I hope, it, uh, hope you didn't feel that anything I said subtracted in the slightest from the marvellous and passionate things you've said. I'm not going to read out your biography all over again, um, but I am, am going to say that um, we must applaud to the echo what you have said and our award of the prize here. So, thank you.